We welcome you all tonight. We're thankful you're with us. It is good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. And they have a noble cause uh, for gathering. Some gatherings, that are, they're good gatherings, enjoyable gatherings, but then there's others that have a, more of a concentrated purpose, and it's good to have them. So we, we welcome you, and those on live stream, we're glad that you're with us tonight, too. <clears throat> we're going to be reviewing the 36th chapter of Genesis tonight. And this is our 59th lesson in Genesis. This is a chapter, if you let it, it'll bore you, but you don't want to let it because we're going to glean a lot of good things from it. The generations of Esau. Now, we wouldn't talk about these at all if they weren't in Scripture. But they are in Scripture, so we want to... Uh, go through it. Some of these names, I'm reading them because this is the only place you read about them, so we'll give them honorable mention because they're in the scripture. Yeah. You can imagine how you'd feel if your name was in the Bible. Amen. Even if it wasn't you, if it was something with your name, that yeah. kind of an honor. 36th chapter of Genesis. Now these are the generations of Esau. Who is Edom? Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholabama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajroth, and Ada bare to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashamath bare Ruel, and Eolibama bare Jeush, and Jalem, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born to him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives, and his sons, and his daughters, and all the persons of his house, and his cattle, and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan, and went into the country from, from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than they could, that they might dwell together, and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites. Well, so often this is, makes a point of this. <laughs> In Mount Seir, these are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau, Ruel, the son of Bashamath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, and Gatim, and Kenaz. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz, Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Ruel, Nahath and Zerah, Shammah and Bizah. These were the sons of Bashamath, Esau's wife. And these were the sons of Eolibamah, the daughter of Anna, of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. And she bare to Esau, Jehush, Jalem, and Korah. These were dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kenaz, Duke Korah, Duke Cal G Gatum, Duke, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. And these are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, Duke Nahath, Duke Zira, Duke Shammah, Duke Mizah. These are the dukes that came from Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Bashamath, Esau's wife. 
And these are the sons of uh, Ahor Libamah, Esau's wife, Duke Jehus, Duke Jalem, Duke Korah. These were the dukes that came from Ahor Libamah, the, the daughter of Anna, Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom. And these are the, their dukes. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land. Lotan, Shobal, Shobal, and Zibian, and Anna, and Dishan, and Ezer, and Dishan. These are the dukes of the Horites, the children of Seir, in the land of Edom. And the children of Lotan were Hori and Heman, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. And the children of Soba were these, Alvin and Mahath and Ebal, Shepho and Onim. And these are the children of Zibion, both Aja and Anna. This was that Anna that found the mules in the wilderness as he fed the asses of Zibion, his father. And the children of Anna were these, Dishon and Eolibama, the daughter of Anna. These are the children of Dishon, Himdad, and Ishban, and Ithran, and Shiran. The children of Ezer were these, Bilha, Bilhan, and Zeavan, and Achan. The children of Dishan are these, Uz, and Aran, Aran. These are the dukes that came from the Horites, Duke Lotan, Luke Dos Shobal, Duke Zibion, Duke Anna, Duke Dishan, Duke Ezer, Duke Dishan, these are the dukes that came of Horai among their dukes in the land of Seir. And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. And Bela, the son of Behor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinabah. And Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozra, reigned in his stead, and Jobab died, and Husham of the land of Timonai reigned in his stead, and Hushim died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Bidian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead, and the name of his city was Avith, Avith. and Hadad, Hadad died, and Shamlah and Mazakah reigned in his stead, and Shamlah died, and Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his stead, and Saul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Ach Achbor reigned in his stead, and Baal Hanan, the son of Achor, died, and Hadar reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Paul. His wife's name was Mehatabel, and the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mezahab. And these are the names of the dukes that came of Esau according to their families after their places, and by their names Duke Timnon, Duke Alvum. Duke Jatheth, Duke Aholibama, and Duke Elah, Duke Penan, Duke Kizan, Kinaz, Duke Teman, Duke Mibzar, Duke Magdiel, Duke Iram. These be the dukes of Edom according to their habitations in the land of their possession. He is uh, Esau, the father of the Edomites. Amen. I suppose by this time you're glad you're not teaching this <laughs> text. <laughs> well, just to show you that there's a lot there, and we'll proceed. You probably noticed that how swiftly those if you're familiar with scripture and you know the genealogy of kings in first and second kings, there's a lot of details of the Israelite kings, but there were none here. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. Died, another come, died, another came, died, nothing. Well, yeah, he found the mules in the wilderness, and then he died. Yeah. yeah. Get into perspective here, what pe a people that's not recognized by God doesn't take long to talk about them in scripture. The, gen the, East, the generation of Esau were through the daughters he had in, in Canaan. He got from Canaan. Mm -hmm. He got his wives from Canaan, although he wasn't at home in Canaan, but he got his wives in Canaan. 
He got a start in Canaan, but he didn't stay in Canaan. His inheritance was someplace else. His genealogy includes a lot of worldly prominent people, dukes, dukes, duke this, duke that, a lot of dukes, or chieftains, tribal leaders. There's a lot of different ways to translate it. And these dukes played a prominent role, some of them in the purpose of God, but it was always incidental. It was never a major. Now, Jacob, he had 12 sons. And uh, Esau had five sons. <laughs> it's kind of, a, kind of a perspective. Each son was given a territory. Canaan was given to Jacob. Seir was given to Esau. See, as creator, God has a right to do this. And incidentally, the land was get the both lands were occupied when they were given. They were occupied by somebody else. Both Esau and Jacob had to clean out the land. Their, their progeny had to clean out the land that was given to them. It wasn't neither one of them were given an empty land. Perhaps you have not been given one either. <laughs> You need to think about that. This is not bad news for lazy Christians. <laughs> there are there are people who think you get something for nothing from God. There are there are people who think this, mm -hmm. and you can tell they do by the success of the spiritual life testifies mm -hmm. that they need to think the thing out a little clearer. The essential differences in the allotment of both the lands was the proximity of to the Lord Himself. That was the Jesus is going to come and spend time in Canaan. He's not going to spend a day in Seir. He died for all men, but he only spent time in Canaan. Now you got to work. You got to work that out yourself. <laughs> you got to work your out, out that, you, that work it out yourself because that contradicts a lot of theology. Died for all men, came to save the world, spent all his time in Canaan. No time to a close cousin there. No time in Seir. Now, from the very first, God established authority over his creation, particularly mankind. He's over all creation. Even the hinds had bring forth calves by his power, the psalmist says. So he's over all creation, but particularly when it comes to mankind, he maintains control over them. He determined that a single infraction from Adam removed the, him and Eve from the garden. God, God determined this. So men, it's none of men's business why he did it. Amen. Even though even though if you're a godly, you can figure it out. But He placed him there and he kicked him out. All right, that contradicts a great body of theology. Now, the people that say, once you're in, you can't be out, have got to explain yeah. why God made Eden for Adam, put Adam and Eve in Eden, and kicked them out. Now, they got to explain this to us. Yeah. We'll have none of their nonsense. Yeah. None of their nonsensical answers about, well, this is true if that's true. No, no, you got to explain why God did this. Yeah. Yeah. And after you've... Struggled with that one. We got another one. He, he made Canaan for Israel. He put Canaan, Israel in Canaan, and he booted them out. All right, you got to explain that. Now, if your theology is right, that you got to explain that. I'm for holding their feet to the fire till they, till they say uncle. Amen. That's got to be answered. If that theology is right, that's got to be answered. All through this record so far, you saw that God saved who he wanted to save. Amen. He elected Noah. Mm -hmm. Noah, one Amen. man in the whole world, if he found grace in the eyes of the Amen. Lord. Was he the only man? I don't know. He was the only man that believed. I, I don't know. But Noah found grace. He, he chose him. He elected to save Noah and his family. I'll tell you one thing. One person had no questions about this uh, was Noah. <laughs> you could have argued about the election with Noah, and he'd say, hey, hey, hey. That's right. 
I'm, I'm quite comforted with the, with the doctrine. Same with Abraham. He chose Abraham from, from among a heathen people, worshiping other gods. His family wasn't even worshiping God. Noah was, a, was a, he was living by faith. Abraham wasn't. He was, him and his father, they were worshiping other gods. And he chose them to be the head of a new race. See, men wouldn't have done it this way. This is all, all in the Bible. God chose to work exclusively through the offspring of Abraham. God made that choice. Currently, what we're viewing now is preparatory work. This is a cultivation of the, breaking up the fallow ground, getting things ready for what he really wanted to do. See, his whole purpose wasn't just to save Noah. <laughs> That's too little. Oh, brethren, it is too little to require a lot of God's attention just saving Noah. And he's not just saving Abraham and his seed. He had something big on the trestle boards of eternity. Amen. He's got a salvation. He's so big as the preparations are going to span millennia. Amen. Just the preparations of it. To this point, God is separated from all humanity. Seth. Shem, son of Noah. And Abraham, and through their genealogy, this they're going to, he's going to work his way to the Messiah through these men out of the millions, probably billions of people. So all of all the messianics, he could be traced back to Seth, and they could all be traced back to Shem. They could all be traced back to Abraham, all the pioneers, so to speak, fathers. Out of the eight sons Abraham had, he had eight sons, Ishmael and Isaac and six through Keturah. Out of eight sons, God chose one. We don't know anything about the others, a little bit about where they lived and some things like this, but we don't know anything else about them. Now, although this is all up to this point has been presented with crystal clarity, I, mean, this is, I haven't said anything that's not clearly Declared in the scripture, absolute supremacy of God, that's surfaced all through here. God did what he wanted. He wanted it. He didn't. He wanted him in the garden. He put him in. He wanted him out of the garden. He took him out. He wanted the world to die. It did. He wanted Noah to, to survive, and he did. See, all through this, God's done what he wanted. So, this, so if this is all you knew, you should reason, I want to get in the will of God. <laughs> I want to be in the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, that's, a, that's at least you should come up with that kind of conclusion. And if you've been a little bit disobedient, you should kick yourself really hard. Because if this is true, if God has represented himself properly, disobedience makes no sense at all. And self-will makes no sense at all. If what we read is true, and it is, it doesn't make any sense for you to live like there's no God. Yeah, right. No, we don't want an explanation. If you're living that way, we don't even want you to explain it. You're ignorant and you need to admit it. Foolish probably be a better word. Since that time, Jesus has began building his church. And the devil, by using doctrines of demons have persuaded people that such things as the sovereignty of God and the election of God and the preference of some people over others is actually a false doctrine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, he's convinced, some people are convinced they'll argue with you, get red in the face about it now. The outcome of, of it all is that for the most part, God's salvation is not seen as something Worthy of forfeiting all competing interests. See, this is what this is the result of believing stuff like that. It doesn't look like salvation is worth the sacrifice Jesus demands of you. Like denying yourself and picking up your cross and not loving anybody or anything more than Him. See, that doesn't make sense unless what we've said is true. So false doctrine 
makes people spiritually lazy. They may be fervent for the institution, but not for God's salvation. Okay, have you found this to be so? Uh, yes. As you were talking about how men, they don't see what they need to forfeit for this salvation. I considered the man who sold all to buy the field because of what was in the field. Yeah, that's right. A passing person who didn't know it was in the field wouldn't think it was really worth selling all he had that's right. just for a field. Mm -hmm. But because he had seen the treasure, just as we have seen what the Lord has to offer, Amen. we forfeit all for it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now those who have preached the gospel for any period of time have set out the salvation of God before many people. I myself before thousands of people have set out the salvation of God and pled with people receive this believe this message and act upon it. But proportionately few people have responded. Why? They didn't think it was worth it. That's why. Mm -hmm. If somebody could convince them they were going to win the lottery, there's a what a $350 million lottery It hasn't been claimed. If somebody could guarantee now, they could guarantee, look, if you buy this ticket, I know this ticket's going to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you buy this ticket, you'll get this $350 million. And if you could convince somebody of that, I can tell you, they'd buy the ticket. That's right. The people aren't convinced Amen. that Jesus is who he said he is and that God acts like he said he acts. They're not convinced of that. So they don't act. Yeah. Does this have anything to do with this record of Jacob? Well, we don't want to present the picture that we're just against what's false. We, we are, but there's, there's more to it than that. See, this record of Jacob makes no sense if God's not sovereign. Mm -hmm. If God can't do what he wants to do, if he's got to wait on man and he can't move until man moves, if that's true, then this record of Jacob, yeah. no wonder people don't read it. Does it make any sense? It's the will and hand of the Lord that makes a total difference. See, in this record of Jacob is what God did, not what Jacob did, not what Abimelech did, not what Bimelech, not Laban did, is what God did that made the difference. Amen. And so he's telling you as he goes through here, look, don't go around telling everybody God has a wonderful plan for their life. He may not have a wonderful plan for their life. Then they may be Pharaoh. You tell them that God has a wonderful plan. We'll work for that. It's all in Christ, and it all hinges on what you do with Christ. Amen. It all hinges on that. And Jesus won't take half time, quarter time, third time, little time. He won't even receive that. He, another, a modern church, they'll receive it. You can go out and do whatever during the week. It doesn't make any difference. It may not be bad stuff, but you, you may just give God it's a little bit of your time, a little bit of your money, a little bit of your thinking, but see, he won't accept it. Yeah. He'll throw it in the garbage can. Amen. You notice all these people we read about so far? Noah, as soon as God starts using him, that's all he did. He worked, did God's work. That's all he did. He didn't do anything else. He wasn't like a local businessman selling lumber. <laughs> uh, uh not Noah. He worked full time on that ark. Come to Abraham, what he was full time. He's working, living for the Lord. He's not he's not doing anything else. This he's working on his purpose. Isaac's the same way, Jacob's the same way. See, a pattern is developing here as we go through here. Now, I said it, it, what God did made the difference. Now, Joshua reminded Israel and trying to give them an incentive to be diligent and follow the Lord. Joshua 24, 14, he said to all the people, <laughs> not, to the, not to the adults or to the elite leaders, he said to all the people, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood, 
in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Naor, and they served other gods. God speaking through judgments. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. I was the difference. Amen. Amen. The difference wasn't a decision point by man. The difference was God's decision. That was the difference. It's the same with you, but you got to search it out. If you're familiar with your own life and you can measure your sensitivities, you can come to a point where you say, this, I, my mind changed at this, this point here. That was God's work. That's what I'm telling you. That God is the one that caused that to happen, just like he caused all this to happen. Yes. And that gives you confidence when you oh, know that. Yes. Amen. That confirms it and gives you confidence Amen. and you press in more. If God be more. for us. Yes. See? Mm -hmm. Amen. A lot of people, and my heart goes out to them, but they're not at that point. They can't say from their heart, if God be for us, who can be against us? They got the yeah, but. Yeah, but. That's the that's the name of a of a doubting theology. Yeah, but the yeah, but theology. Then God He begins this nation with Abraham, whom He took, the other side of the, it was the other side like of the Nile is what He's talking about. The other side there. Or it could be the other side of the Red Sea where they crossed. And He started with Abraham, who was incapable of starting anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you got. <laughs> That you got to see. <laughs> I've chosen you, Abraham. I'm going to develop a great nation from you, Abraham. But Abraham's impotent. And his wife's barren. That's God. You were talking about God now. Amen. So do you expect God to demand of you to do something that you already know you can do? You're off on the wrong foot. Right away, you're off on the wrong foot. This isn't how God works. You have to see the impossibility of it all. <clears throat> make a new, you know, the Ezekiel told the people, make yourself a new heart. You think you can do a lot of things? And Moses told the people, circumcise your hearts. And later they told both, both Moses told him God will circumcise your heart, and Ezekiel told him God will give you a new heart. But he first, you've got to see that what God requires of you, you of yourself can't do. Amen. That's right. And keeping the law is a very, that's the smallest part of it all. You got to have a new heart and a new mind that will allow you to be 100% for the Lord. That's before you can get in. That, you can't even get in without this, see? That's why Abraham had to leave. Noah had to build, Abraham had to leave, Isaac had to leave and stay in Canaan, Jacob had to stay in Canaan, see that? Before the work got underway, you had to agree to the terms. When Jacob was brought into the purpose, his wife's barren too. Isaac's wife was barren too. Now there are different ways of looking at these circumstances. One is that, well, things finally just kind of worked out. Got a kind of a bad start, but in due time, everything worked out. Because we can do it, we can do it, we can do it. And it all worked out. But that's, uh, that's not a proper way to look at it. The idea is that God worked it out, but first he convinced the people that he could. He had some preliminary things he did just to show them, I can do this. What I've told you I'm going to do, I, I can do this. I don't need a robust young man and a fertile young woman. I don't even need that. I make things happen. Amen. See? He deliberately acts in a way that contradicts the way of men. Now when suddenly it dawns on a human spirit that what God has asked them to do they can't do it. They're not just philosophizing. It isn't because somebody else told them they couldn't do it. 
So you may say, well, you can't do it. And the, the person, no, this is the person who's tried to do it. And he concluded, this is, this ark is too big. I can't build this. Now you're ready for God to work. <laughs> He first confirms that the natural state of man is wholly inadequate. Mm -hmm. Now let's get to this text. <coughs> the generations of Esau he, in Canaan. First, first we're going to view him when he was in Canaan. Now why do you suppose such a large section of scriptures devoted to Esau and before him to Ishmael? Neither of them were heirs according to the promise. But God's showing us that he does not choose a person where he does, when he does not choose a person, there is no way they can become affiliated with what he's doing. Okay? He's showing you that. Ishmael, he was, he was Abraham's son. He's born to a, another woman, but but now Esau, he was born to the same mother at the same time that Jacob was born. So that at birth, they, it looked like they had equal standing, but in the belly, they didn't have equal standing. They were two different kinds of people in the womb. Is that what God told them? I say in the womb. There were two different kinds of people. So that's the first thing you want to learn here, that if God's not in the beginning... He's not going to be in the ending. Amen. And if he is in the beginning, you can depend on him and trust him to finish the work. Amen. The prophets also fall into this category. They were all chosen. John the Baptist, the 12 apostles, Paul, all the people Jesus appeared to after he raised from the dead. Peter told Cornelius' household, he appeared to those chosen. There were special chosen people. First one he chose to appear to was Mary Magdalene. That was Mary Magdalene. That was the first one he <laughs> he, chose, he appeared to some women. He appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to a special appearance to James. He said it was a special one sometime to Cephas, then to the apostles, and then to above 500 brethren. And went. All of them were hand-picked. So that's hard for me to accept. You'll not go make one inch of progress until you can accept that. Amen. That's right. You'll just stumble like a drunken man through the scripture until you can accept that because that's right at the front part. Great men of God were chosen by God. That included Moses and Aaron and David and Zerubbabel and the Levites and all. Whole host of people all chosen. God chose Jerusalem. He says, here's where I'm going to put my name. I'm going to, this is going to be the center point of my, my work. And what is taught in Scripture is frequently illustrated in Scripture, like the records we're reading now. Esau, who is Edom? He may, <laughs> who is Edom? He may make that, because the prophets are going to prophesy against Edom, yeah, uh -huh. which was a territory and a people. So he'd keep bringing this up. Esau, he's Edom. That's who he is. The name Esau, Esau means he that acts or finishes. That is a, is a man's man's idea. He was, I mean, if you looked at Esau, you say, that's the man there, that's the man. He's the one who can do it. But they named him Edom. The word Edom some people say it means hairy, but generally everyone acknowledges that the name Edom means red. <clears throat> Some have speculated that it's because of his red hair. Well, see, this is, uh, this is a dead giveaway that they need to do a little bit more research in the scripture. They need to do a little more, a little less lexical research, a little less dictionary research, a little more biblical research. Because the scriptures tell us why he was named Edom or Red. It wasn't because of his hair. He may have had red hair, but that's not why he was called Edom. Here's his Genesis 25 30. 
Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Because that red pottage. It's because Edom sold his birthright for a mess of red lentil stew. That's why he was called red. What? <laughs> In other words, every time Esau was mentioned, you thought, he sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. That's the first thing you, Edom, that's the first thing you think about. So he was named according not to a hair, according to his deed. Esau, now, see, in Scripture, some people are noted for, for certain things. Like Judas is called the traitor. That's, that's what he's noted for. David is called a man after God's own heart. Noah is noted for building the ark. Uzzah was noted for touching the ark of the covenant. Balaam was noted for loving the wages of unrighteousness. But Esau, <laughs> he's noted for selling his birthright. For a pot of red stew. Now, I know some people that were once identified with us that have sold their birthright. Yeah, right. Most of them have been for pleasures for sin for a season. But they sold their birthright. Just as surely as there was a point in time when Esau did this. With these people, there was a point in time where they sold out. And every time I hear their name, I don't remember what they were any more than I don't remember what Esau was. You remember what, you're, what they're noted for now is what you remember them for. Now you see, his sons are named Ruel, Jeish, Jalem, Korah. That's not the Korah that was very well known in Moses' day. But you notice how little is known of his sons? I come to the sons of Jacob. There's a lot known about them. But they're very little known. See, flesh is inferior. Amen. You really got to see that. And if all a person has to recommend them is their natural condition or natural aptitude, it just not a lot, a lot to say about them. It's developed here. Flesh profits nothing. Amen. Could be Esau. Now, I imagine Esau was impressive. Look, all the dukes, a bunch of dukes. Uh -huh. that, so what? Mm -hmm. They weren't important at all. Now, we have come uh, to a time where there's different kinds of Christianity. I think a mistake a lot of people make is that Christianity is like a term for the whole thing. It's just a kind of a... No, there's different kinds of Christianity, different brands of it. Varying doctrines that are actually owing to different gods they're serving. It's not as simple as they're misrepresenting God. No, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. It's that they're worshiping another god. That accounts for the variance, just like it did in Esau. Account for his variance. Now Esau took his wives, took everything he had. Wives, his sons, his cattle, the whole thing, and he, he left. There come a time when Jacob and Esau had to separate. Now at this time, they themselves were getting along, but the land couldn't support them. Lot went, Abraham went through the same thing with Lot. It's exactly the same thing. The land couldn't sustain their crops. Yeah. Their herds, you know, all of them. And it wasn't until after, after Lot left, God said, now, uh -huh. lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, yeah. from where you're at. Look, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, all this land I'm going to give to you. It wasn't until after Lot left. We're going to find it similar with Jacob. After Esau left, things kind of begin to broaden out. Some considerations prompted by this circumstance are Abraham could not see the entirety of the land as long as Lot was there. 
the extent of the land couldn't be perceived. Yes. Why? Because Lot took a lot of his time. And Lot was a righteous man, but he wasn't in the lineage. Abraham couldn't walk through the land and peruse it. As long as Lot was there, he just kept busy with other things. See, don't you see this, brothers and sisters? Maybe you're among this group of people. They're so busy with other things, they don't have time to survey the land. They don't have time to see what God's given to them that love Him. They just are just too busy with other things. Well, you can't point out in the Bible where what they're doing is wrong. It's not, it's not like that. But if you see it right, if you're the person you see it right, it becomes wrong. Yeah, there's some people that bleed off. Now they do. you got to see this. There's some people that bleed off your energies and you just can't survey the land. You just can't walk through it. God just doesn't show you very much because you're, you're busy trying to keep things calm down and all this. See, now we, we applaud people that try and do this. We're this Blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called the children of God. But there comes a time when Esau's got to go. Amen. And there comes a time when Lot's got to go. Jacob didn't run Esau out of the country. Yeah, no. The Lord did it. That's right. Amen. So he leaves. See, at first, Jacob left because of Esau. But now Esau leaves. We're going to find because of Jacob. Now, in this movie, you find a vivid picture of how people who are in some way associated with the Lord, leave them. At the first, they leave some of their interests to follow the Lord. You know, and they, uh, they don't give themselves holy to the Lord, but they give what they consider to be a significant amount of time to the Lord. Stated another way, they like to choose the state church members, like a church member, and have their name on the roll, but this is how spiritual life is. If you give a little time to it, pretty soon it goes, starts going down. This is how this is how it works. Spiritual life cannot be sustained with a little interest. It, it can't be. And pretty soon, you don't feel so comfortable in Canaan. Maybe you maybe you like to go back and visit once in a while, but you really got to move out someplace else. See, it's all there. And he took all his substance. Uh -huh. He didn't want to leave any back here and have to come back. He knew, I, I got to get out of here. Uh -huh. The immediate reason was the land can't sustain us. But see, there was something at the root. Uh -huh. God couldn't proceed with his work like he went with Esau in the land. It had, it had to come a separation. And notice what it says. He, he went from the face of his brother. That's interesting. He went from the face yeah. of his brother. Yeah, <laughs> He is for, this is covenant language. It isn't some personal thing between him and Jacob. That wasn't it. This was, this was God's work in here. God's, God's covenant is going to be through Jacob. It's not going to be through Esau. Amen. We can't take a chance that one of Esau's daughter, daughters marrying one of Jacob's daughters. And pretty soon we've got an intermarried family. And you see, we don't want. That can't happen. And he moved far enough away so that there wasn't any regular contact. The official reason they couldn't dwell together. The land of Seir, where he went, it, was a, it wasn't like across the world, but it, it wasn't like the children. The, the Ammonites, they were given a plot of land right smack in the middle of Canaan, right next to Benjamin's property. But these, they were, it was further away. Egypt was kind of close. Assyria is kind of close, but they were in, but they moved. there was a distance there, a distance between them. See, you must see that you can't sustain spiritual life with minimal involvements with the people of God. I know, I've heard the arguments, 
we're strong, we know how to do it, we're our own person, we have Bible study at home. But I've heard all that stuff, but I've also seen the result of it. That nobody can convince me of this. I know that salvation is not calculated to have a bank for pennies. No, sir. It's not. So the world wants to get, they like to locate where it's kind of close. Like, at least we could have a Christian funeral. Or some people used to like to ask Christian marriage, and I'd have to turn it down. It's, I, can't, I can't marry you. My advice to my say, go to the JP. Go to the Justice of the Peace. You'll be married. Don't ask the church to be involved in your marriage. I have to tell some people this. So well, there's a lesson to be learned there. Esau is Edom. They keep, keep making this. <laughs> now the Edomites, see, they lived a long time after Esau died. We still got the, but they're they're from Esau. Mm -hmm. Amen. Just like all men from Adam, all men are sinners. Mm -hmm. All believers from are for Abraham. See, who you came, who you've come from, is important. In the kingdom of God. It is true that sinners are condemned because they sin, but that's not the only reason. It's also because they came from the sinner who was Adam. There's a sense in which our spiritual lineage accounts for what we are. There's a sense in which that's true. John makes clear how this lineage can be verified. Here's what he said. 1 John 3, 7 through 10. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whoever doeth, doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now, some people can't accept that. They say sinneth not means it doesn't sin a lot. But it's, it's from a linear point of view. He, he stopped sinning. The idea is there's a line of demarcation. He, he was a sinner up to this point, and sin, he that is born of God cannot sin. He, he can't go on, go on living. He can't do it. The only people that sin are people that go on living in sin. That's how you, that's how you can distinguish who does righteousness. See, some people have no idea what does it mean to do righteousness. They don't really know. You say the average church member You've got to be righteous. They don't have the faintest idea what you mean. Maybe you mean you shouldn't smoke or drink. They don't know what that means. So the church has got to teach people what that means. To live soberly, godly, and righteously in this present world, you've got to learn what that means because that's what distinguishes the people of God from the people of Satan. That's what, what John said. Not many people hear that preached. The generations of Esau and Mount Seir. That was where the property God had given to them. Seir. In Christ, for example, proper increase is going to take it in the right place. It has to be in the right place. The children of God can't increase in Seir. See? And the development of the Edomite nation can't be in Canaan. <laughs> He's got to go to their own place. The Mount Seir was the place. Spiritual growth and advance are realized where we've been placed in Christ. God placed Jacob Amen. in Canaan. Right. And he also moved Esau to Seir where spiritual productivity didn't take place there. And Jesus never visited Seir. The names of Esau through his wives, he lists. 
Because if he didn't, you never would know about them. If he didn't tell you these men were born, you'd, <laughs> they're not mentioned anywhere else. You'd not know at all. You might have thought he, he lived and died single and with no children. If he didn't tell you, because they're... But he tells us who they are. Five sons. And the development of this people is going to be like the development of a people for the Messiah. The people are going to give birth to something. The people are. You remember they, it was said of Israel, unto us a child is born unto us a son is given. See, the, the people produced this. The sons of Jacob didn't produce anything like a Messiah. There was no great world leader that came from Esau. Didn't come from it. Come from Israel in Canaan. They were in Canaan. You see why Esau had to get out? Had to get out of Canaan. Then he throws in, he says there was a concubine. Eliphaz had a concubine, and he had a boy through her named Amalek. Amalek? Oh. He's a prominent person in the scripture at Amalek. Here's where he's produced. Produced in Esau's lineage. At the Amalekites, that's who Israel was fighting when Moses, when Aaron and her held up Moses' hand, remember? Yeah. It was the Amalekites who they were fighting. Amalek. They fought Israel all through their, all their history. They were formidable enemies, so often they joined together with the Ammonites. The Edomites and the Ammonites, they joined together in opposing Israel. Now these Amalekites were the progeny of Amalek, who was one of the grandsons of Esau. Satan raised them up to be aggressors. God raised up a savior. Satan raises up a deceiver. That's what Antichrist is. It's Satan's answer to Christ. That's what it is. Amalek. Now for another point of view, God is superintending this whole matter. Satan may raise up enemies, but God governs the whole situation. That's why I said of our Lord, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, thou rulest, and rulest thou not over all the kingdoms of the heathen? Yes, he did. He's governing the Edomites so that eventually he's going to save a bunch of people from there. He told, he told through the prophets, he said, I'm going to save a lot of people. All nations are going to come and worship me. So he's building, you got to see this, <laughs> he's building these nations from which he's going to glean a tremendous harvest toward the end of time, see? And he's, Edomites were, were some of them. Then he names the sons of rule. They were dukes. And, was, and he lists off the dukes. There were 13 dukes, I believe. Leaders, famous men. But nobody's in the kingdom, but famous yeah. on earth. And then... He goes back, he le takes a little leap back, and he tells you that before Esau took over the seer, other inhabitants lived there. <clears throat> like other inhabitants lived in Canaan before Israel took it over. The, the Horites lived in Seir before the Edomites took it over. And the Horites, they, they dwelt in caves where they built their cities in the rocks. An example of their expertise is in the city of Petra. I've got some pictures of it here. This, it was sculptured in the rock that was in the mountains. And they could say caves. They lived in caves. That's what it means. They made 
homes in the rocks. That, that, they kept the land, the Horite kept the land before the Edomite took over. Why? Well, to keep the land cultivated, keep the land from being run over by bees. They protected the land like the, like the heathen nations got the land ready for Israel. See, <laughs> that's what they actually did. They, were, they took care of the land till the Canaanites, till the Israelites got there. That's what these Horites did. <coughs> the land belonged to Edom from, from day one. When God delivered Israel from Egypt, they had to journey through by the Edomites land, Seir. And Moses told him, Deuteronomy 32, 8, the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, and he separated the sons and set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. That was from the beginning. The sons of Adam. The sons of Adam. He separated them with Israel in mind. And these this land was kept for them, like this land was kept for the Edomites by the Horites. Some versions say Horam instead of Horites. Say Horam. The word Horam is like a transliteration of the word Horite. Horite describes it from the standpoint of the people. Horam describes it from the standpoint of a place, but it's the same, it means the same, same thing. Some people say that these were like giants, and they may have been very well giants. All right, some of these people, he throws a sentence in there that like, makes you shake your head. It said, this is that Anna that found the mules in the wilderness found mules in the wilderness. Some versions, they don't say mules. So, uh, those that like think that the various versions clear up the text, you know, they think that. Here's what some of the other versions read. They found the water in the wilderness. That's, what, that's why they translate the mules in the wilderness. They found the hot springs, New American Standard. They found the springs, New Revised Standard. They found mules in the wilderness, that's Geneva Bible. They found jammin in the wilderness. They found the imam, that means giants, in the wilderness. Contemporary English version says they found an oasis. And you say, well, what, what did they find? Did they find water, hot water, giants, mules, what? It's all different people, they, they kind of take divvy up sides on it. They say, Honest uh, scholars say, well, the word is hard to understand. We're not sure what the word translated mules means. Now, some people, they dogmatically say that it, it does mean mules. Adam Clark says, my own opinion is that mules were not known before the time of Anna and that he was probably the first one who coupled the mare and the ass together to produce this mongrel or the first who met with creatures of this race in some very secluded part of the wilderness. So they, they, see, mules, they're the result of crossbreeding, ox and ass, or horse and ass, and they're a, a freakish part of nature. And it, I prefer mule because it kind of fits in with the context. I don't see what occupying the land and had to do with finding hot springs. If you have herds, so what are you going to do with hot springs if you have herds? See, so I, I think it, it was this. It was depicted the kind of person that Esau and their inhabitants were. Now, here's another thing that you want to pick up on this, that it, this is God's way of giving an inheritance. He allocates the inheritance first. Then he lets the persons prepare for inhabiting the inheritance. He did that with Esau. He did that with his people, too. And he did it with Israel, too. He gives them the inheritance first, tells them what keep, and tells them about, you're going to inherit the land, gives them, lets them, gives them time to develop for it, and then they inherit the land. Now, this is exactly the way it is in Christ. You've got to see that this is exactly the way it is in Christ. 
First, he tells you, I've, got, I've saved an incorruptible inheritance for you. I'm reserved an inheritance in heaven for you now. So you, but now, my part, thing is, I'm getting you ready. The inheritance doesn't have to get ready here, but it's, it's kept pure. I keep it up here so it's, it's stay pure. <laughs> I keep it up here. And then he's getting you ready to inherit it, the inheritance. See, the kingdom was prepared from the foundation of the world. But it doesn't end there. That people had to be ready to enter into it. See, Jesus was determined to be a high priest. But he had to be prepared on earth to occupy the place of the high priest. See, he had to get ready to fill that position. Israel, Canaan was their country. But they had to be prepared. They had to be sick and tired of living in other countries. See, and Egypt, Egypt worked that out in them. Boy, they say, hey, we don't like this being a foreigner. We don't like this. Don't like being a misfit. I'm kind of fed up with it myself. Yes, Aren't you? Kind of, you find it hard to find a place where you can put on your tent, you know, pegs. That's the way it is. God allocates your inheritance, prepares you for it, then you occupy it. You see it here. Now, and he throws on another little something in there. It looks like it's unrelated. He, he tells you the dukes that were among the Horites. They weren't related to Esau. Mm -hmm. They occupied the land before Esau's band went in, but they had a bunch of dukes too, mm -hmm. the Horites. And these dukes kept the land from being run over, kept order so that it wasn't destroyed. See, when Israel left Canaan, it became a wasteland. And in 1948, when they occupied the land again, the land was a wasteland. There's some places they can't flourish unless the proper people are in them. Amen. You take a church, quote, unquote, and you put ungodly people in it, it won't flourish. Amen. Some degree of civility may be able to be maintained, but they're not going to be any fruit. The right people have to be there. This is why it's wrong to emphasize bringing lost people into the church. At some point, they have to come in contact with the church. We understand that. We don't, we're not against, understand. We're not against that at all. What we're saying is that can't be the fundamental thing. The church is not made for sinners. It's made for the household of God. Amen. That's what it's made for. It's made for God to dwell in it. Anyway, these dukes of the Horites are named, and they were keeping the land intact. So when they come in, it wasn't filled up with lions and beasts and overgrown. And see, when Israel came in, they inherited vineyards and fruit trees and fields and houses. See, they were built by other people. That's what, he, that's what Moses told them. They're going to be built by other people. But he got the land ready. He did that for the Edomites. Yes. I heard you talking about how these dukes came in and they took care of the land until the Israelites came in. I considered like the patriarchs and the brethren who wrote the scriptures how we had this prepared so then when we came and when we That's right. learned of the Lord, we had this prepared so that way we wouldn't have to do all this extra harder labor, but it was already prepared for us. That's right. We're entering into another man's labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And ultimately, the other man is Jesus. We're entering into his yeah. labors. This, this is how it works. And a lot of what we have experienced and know, somebody else plowed up the fallow ground. Someone else had to go through all the hardship that's associated with get, getting, hold of, getting hold of truth while you're in a garbage dump. It's, some people had to go through and they got it, and then they passed it on, see. Amen. This is how God works this way. The salvation is too big for it just to be zero in on you and just you be the only thing interested. It's not, it's not that simple at all. And after it tells about these dukes of the Horites, he goes back to the dukes of Esau. He names them again. But the list he names is different than the one he named before. The names are different. In Genesis 36, 15 through 19, I list the names there. And the text right here, names are different. Why? 
Well, since there was a scribal error, that's what it is. It's an error in the translation. Now, there's other answers. The answer's in the text, actually. This list here is after the, P, after the Edomites inhabited the land, these are the dukes he names here. The other dukes he named was before they inhabited, see, the land. And he, he says it was according to their families after their places. See, that wasn't how the first list was given. So that's the answer to the variance of that, that list. And that we understand that some years passed, there was some intermarrying done, and, but that these are the dukes at the time they occupied the land. And that's what counts, is who you are after you occupy the land. That's what tells the real story. When you're first born again, that's the beginning. That is the beginning and not the ending. <laughs> At some point, you got to get to the point where you don't trust in that. You can't trust in the beginning. You can't. If you're an Israelite, you can't put your faith in the fact that I came out of Egypt. Yeah. I crossed the Red Sea. You, know, you 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 got to live by faith in the land. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now let's draw a few preliminary conclusions. I'm sorry for the brevity of this lesson. So far in uh, Genesis, we've come across several genealogies. So there's got to be some significance to them. First gen genealogy was no, Adam, we didn't have a genealogy. Adam doesn't have a genealogy. Just everybody came from him. That was from one, but he doesn't have. Yeah. First man where a genealogy is listed is Noah. Yeah. Because he re the earth was repopulated through Noah's sons. And there's so he lists a genealogy of Noah's sons and grandsons, and through them the families of the earth, the Gentiles, were created from him. From him, then we read about Nahor. That's Abraham's brother. Nahor's genealogy. His first two sons were Huz and Buzz. Now nobody's used those names that I know of. Twin boys, Huz and Buzz. That was their names. And you, and you list Nahor's genealogy because Abraham's going to get his wife, Isaac's going to get, Jake, get his wife, Jacob's going to get his wife from Nahor's family tree. See, that's so that so we, we learn about Nahor. And then Abraham's genealogy is a little bit more extensive. Then we're given Ishmael's genealogy from whom uh, Gentiles, in particular Arabs, came. Esau's genealogy were Gentiles, the Edomites came from then. Jacob's genealogy is only Jews. <laughs> it's interesting, huh? And he had more sons. He had more sons than the others had. Which means God had intended to build a big house. Big house. See, a nation is being built through which the Messiah is going to come. And they're going to institute a culture, spiritual culture, into which Jesus can be inserted and in which he can be raised up. Now, I don't mean to be derogatory, speak derogatorily of anybody, but Jesus could not be raised in an American church. He could not. There wasn't enough there to feed his soul. He, could, he couldn't just live by the time he's 12 years old. He just couldn't live with the synagogue teaching. Huh? He, get, he had to meet with the doctors in the temple. He had this voracious appetite. He's growing in the wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He had to have something to stand. He couldn't have got it if he was in America. And I'm convinced that not very great leaders can. Great spiritual leaders generally haven't been born here. I mean, they can't be. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> stating, stating the case here. Abraham's genealogy, Ishmael's genealogy, Esau's genealogy, and Jacob's genealogy. 
And actually, they're going to, they're, all these people concentrate on a relatively small part of the world. I got a little circle there where they lived. They're in what they call now the 1040 window. This is where that is. It's a cluster of nations shaped kind of like an egg. And Israel, just a little sliver, you can hardly see it right in the middle of that. But this happens to be the crossroads of the world. The whole world has to go through this territory when they travel. Now what God's doing in these Esau, Ishmael, Jacob, all these genealogies, he's developing the world with the final harvest in mind. That's what you got to see. Genesis 15, God said to Abram, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land from the river Egypt, as Nile, to the great river Euphrates. That's that circle that I, you see down there. That's the territory taken in there. Now they might not occupy all that territory personally, but they were going to influence David, for instance, he took, paid, ta those nations all paid taxes to, um, during David's reign. Tribute. Sojourn in this land, God told Isaac, sojourn in this land. I'm going to give all these nations, all these countries to you. I'm going to perform the oath. That's all these countries around there. I'm going to perform the oath. So what, what is God doing? He's developing a world that will meet his objectives, yes, his final objectives. Now let me read some of the things that tell you how magnificently large the salvation of God is. Psalm 2, Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That's said of Hebrews 1 quotes this as head of Jesus. I'm going to give you that. Well, what if there weren't any heathen to give? Hmm? But see, he, he made these, right. these genealogies yeah. that made all these nations. Noah's sons, a whole bunch of nations. See, Esau, a bunch of nations. Ishmael, a bunch of nations. He's, de he's getting ready to fulfill this promise. Mm -hmm. There's going to be somebody to give him. Again. Psalm 22, 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Now that, that's speaking about more than every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. It's just bigger. We're talking something bigger than that. Psalm 72, 11. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. This is, yeah. What nations? The nations we're reading about the, their founders, those. Isaiah 2, 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. See? They're going to come. They're going to come to God's land from their land. They're going to have to leave their land. They're going to have to leave their land to get what God's promised. Yes. Oh, just, then you got a picture of it at Pentecost, a down payment of this happened. Yeah. They came in from all the different, all the nations. They came in, yeah. flowed into Jerusalem. Again, Jeremiah 3.17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered into it. To the name of the Lord in Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their own evil heart. <laughs> They're going to leave. All the Ishmaelites, the Esauites, the Edomites, all the other rites, they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. Something's going to show them the uniqueness of Christ. The church hasn't been able to do that for the last 2,000 years. It's not been able to do it. Nobody confesses this, <coughs> but this is the fact in the case. The world has done a miserable job. The church has done a miserable job of trying to reach the world. It has not done well at all. It's just sat people of a lot of money. That's about what it boils down to. And why? Because it doesn't have a message. It doesn't have the message. That's what the trouble is. 
But the time's going to come when the message is going to be preeminent again. And when it is, the nations will come in. That's what he said. Many nations, here it is again, Zechariah 2.11. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. This is going to happen. Somewhere in this uh, lesson I made reference to the promise he made of Israel, Egypt, and Syria. Be a highway that will connect all three of these. They're all adjacent communities. Egypt here, Israel in the middle, Syria, the larger part called Assyria. He said they're going to be, and they're going to be Egypt, my people, Israel, my people, Syria, my people. They'll all be joined together. When that happens, there'll be a, quote, evangelistic, unquote, explosion, the likes of which the world has never seen. The head of that group's going to be Israel. And they're going to, the world's going to turn. Why? Because they're going to be real, some of the real lineage yes, amen. is going to be there. That's right. All right, now God, in our text, is preparing for that time. That's why those genealogies are there. Uh -huh. Just to let you know, they just those, gene, those peoples just didn't happen. This was the work of God yes. who uh, raised them up. Yeah. Any, again, I uh, apologize for the brevity of the lesson. I thought it was this kind of lesson. It was. You can lose, I, I saw that I, was, I would lose the significance of the lesson if I developed it too much, got into the details too much, it would kind of hide what I was. So I, I could, I, finally I saw I had said enough. <laughs> I trust that you was able to kind of pick up on it and see it. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Judah? In this gene genealogy, it's showing that God doesn't gloss over people that aren't His. He doesn't just go over it, and say we don't need to, we don't we don't need to look at this people because my chosen people are over here. We we can just disregard this. It shows the specificity of the of of salvation, and even those who are in opposition, God shows us. This is what the enemies are. Look at them so you could recognize them and throw them out. Yeah. Yeah, Silas? Whenever you, you were talking about whenever some people can't say, who, if God be for us, who can be against us without putting a yeah, but in there. The reason they put that in there is because they aren't looking at, looking at it through faith. Mm. That's good. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you can see that um, some people say, well, God will never violate your free will. But how you explain some of this stuff that you just went over? How are you explain it when Esau just decides to go ahead and move over there because there's not enough room? It appears as though that was the reason, and yet we know behind the scenes God's moving him over That's there. That's right. Just like he moved Jacob in. That's right. All right, we'll have a word. Yes? But during the last page of your lesson, there were some tornado sirens going off. There was what? Tornado sirens going off. So apparently there's, looks like a pretty storm brewing out there. Can we pray about that as we close to? Okay, they're still, are they still going off? I don't hear them now, but they were going oh, off. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Amen. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your protection, for your care for your people. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to teach us this in this area of trusting and having faith, and at the same time being wise and alert. There comes a time we know we must flee to the mountains and escape. We thank thee that those are not frequent times. Now we pray that these uh, things that we have learned tonight will stay with us and that be part of our thinking processes. 
In Jesus' name, amen.